Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting to order. I'm Dave Farrell, we now have Terry Jr. I'm the chairman of the Community Police Oversight Board. We're here to have a forum of our board, so let's get started. Before we begin, by a show of hands, how many would like to address the board this evening? So we're going to have 15 minutes of public coming at the beginning of the meeting, and then towards the end, we'll have public come in again. 15 minutes, the first five people um, will get three minutes each. If you could go ahead and line up on the first row, first five people that want to be public come in. First row in the center. You got one, two, three, All right, see so if we got one, two, three, four, and five. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna we're gonna have the quorum, just as you would in city council meeting. We're gonna be respectful as speakers, and we're also gonna be respectful to speakers even if they're saying something that we don't agree with. There will be no threats. No one will be threatening to come to someone's house, to come to their job, or anything of that nature. You will not address any board member by name. You would direct all your comments to the chair. Uh, we may begin. Three minutes each, first person. Or we can just start. we start with you, sir. Please state your name and your city, your city council member. All right, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> My name is Jason Howard Moore. I'm chairman of the Federation Campaign. I'm here to discuss a matter that I discussed at this, in front of the same board the last time I was here, and that's as to these two counterfeit search warrants with false case numbers Okay. Sir, so let, me, let, me, let me stop you real quick. So you filed a, you filed, you did file a complaint, correct? Yeah, I'm going to discuss that in a second, sir. Are you going to let me speak? But I, I just want to ask a question. You, you did right. file a complaint yes, in the last Yes, I did. Week. I'm going to get to that. I'm going to get have, to that. Have you followed up with the, um... Sir, are you going to let me speak and get my details on the record, sir? No, I'm going to let you speak. I'm just asking okay. a question. Did you follow up I, on your... I, th that's what I'm going to discuss today. Yes, I did. I've been dealing with the dis district attorney's office for the last two days at the Frank Crowley Courts. And I've also been uh, in contact mm -hmm. with the Dallas Police Department directly and the mm -hmm. Urban Police Department these last two days. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm dressed the way I'm dressed right now, because I just came back from uh, the, the court speaking with uh, mm -hmm. Public Integrity Unit mm -hmm. uh, Chief And Prosecutor. I apologize for interrupting. Now, may I move forward, please? Okay. May I speak? May yes, I, I, I apologize for interrupting. Okay. okay. Now, as I was saying, last time I was here, I brought these two counterfeit warrants signed by Dallas County District Judge Stephanie Mitchell Huff of the 291st District Court with false case number 252541-2015, which have been proven to be false case numbers. These two search warrants were maliciously manufactured by Detective Jabari Howard of the Dallas Police Department, batch number 8427. They unlawfully arrested me. They did a whole bunch of things that I'm not going to go into right now. But the issue is, is I came here, I asked this board to do something about it. I filed a complaint that day. I spoke with someone, uh, Tatiana, I believe her name was, or something close to that. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard a word back. But what I did receive is an email stating that my complaint will be forwarded to the same internal affairs uh, uh, division in the Dallas Police Department that's been denying me justice for the last four years. These are third degree felonies by the Texas Penal Code. They were manufactured to defraud and to harm me. There are false governmental records and they are search warrants, which means under the Texas Penal Code, these are, th are third degree felonies. And I demand that these people be investigated and prosecuted. 
I can't get help from this, from the complaint that I filed at this very board. I've asked you guys to do something about it. I have plain evidence, a mountain of evidence of government corruption and law enforcement corruption, plain evidence, and everyone, including the media, keeps looking the other way. So I know, I know no one gives a damn about somebody from South Dallas, even though I left South Dallas and moved to Las Colinas and changed my life. I know nobody cares about that. I know that District 7, nobody cares about. I get that. But we cannot have these public officials, these law enforcement officers, making counterfeit warrants. Because if they made one, if they made two, who's to say there's not a third, a fourth, and a fifth? So at this point, since I know that this council is just set up for the public as a dog and pony show, which is my opinion, I want to know who do I complain to to get something done about a corrupt police officer that's out there right now that can easily do this again with the same corrupt judge that's sitting over there at the Frank Crowley court. What are we going to do about it? That's what I want to know. What's, what, what's, what's happened with the complaint? Why is it being forwarded to the uh, uh, Eternal Affairs as opposed to being handled by this board? Because we all know that the Eternal Affairs, we know how they operate. Well, I know how they operate personally, and that's to conceal and to cover up. They don't have the, the, the public's interest at heart. And I hope this board knows that I'm not playing. You better get used to my face, because I hope you can see that I'm not somebody that's just going to come and make one complaint. Okay, I, sir, I, I hate to interrupt. Your, your time is up. Can I just get an answer to my question? What are we going to do about this? Uh, we'll get uh, Tatiana. What are we going to do about this, board members? Do we have, a, do we have any updates? On, um, on where the status is of his in investigation. Thank you. So if it's going to IA, then that investigation is going to be on hold until we get a monitor hired so that the monitor can observe that investigation. So it, it may be some time before we get a monitor so that your, that investigation will be monitored. Get used by to my face. Every last one of y'all, get used to my face. I'm not going anywhere. Every last one of them going to be brought to justice. And I mean that, brother. Thank you, sir. I'll get your name, address. How you doing? My name is Lewis Morton. Uh, I stay in the uh, 7th District, uh, South Dallas. Uh, that's my cousin y'all just hearing from. Uh, mm -hmm. You can see that he's, you know, a little upset, but I'm not going to get up here and bash anybody. Uh, I want to talk about Jabari Howard, too. Um, I also seen the, the, you know, the amount of evidence that he have, you know, uh, by me dealing with law, law enforcement, I know how it's done. I know right is right and wrong is wrong. You know, um, I done seen the, pretty, pretty much every evidence that he have, and I know that it don't make sense. And, and, you know, you can easily look at it too and look at the amount of evidence that he have that it don't make sense either. You know, like I said, right is right and wrong is wrong. But uh, for him to be doing this, Jabari Parker that I'm talking about, for him to be doing this, this well, not to say that he done done it already, not just to say that he, he'll do it again. You know, it's just, it's just unacceptable. It's just unacceptable. That's, that, that's just all I have to say. Like I said, I'm not going to bash anybody. I'm not going to, you know, lash out at anybody. I just want to just, just state my, my, my uh, you know, my statement on, a, on an issue because I felt like it was, uh, it, was, it was beneficial for me to come down here and speak on his behalf because obviously he's not getting no, no word from nobody. Don't nobody really want to hear what he had to say. So I understand why he ticked off, but like I said, I'm, I'm here on his behalf, and I just feel like, you know, it was beneficial for me and him because, you know, he's a family member to come down here and speak on his behalf. So if I got to come back and more family members got to come back to, to talk about this issue, we, would, we can do that. But thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. Good evening, sir. Name, address? Kent Burgess, Caddo, Texas. Yes, sir. Y'all doing all right this evening? Pretty good, how you doing? I'm good so far. What I've come to talk about is a seven year old issue with the city of Dallas. It stems back to August or April 21st, 2013, when Officer Brian Burgess was in an accident. He was a Dallas PD officer. Some of the officers on the side of the room probably will cringe when they hear that name. He was prosecuted, cleared within one hour by the jury. And we finally get all the testimony and open records and the city documents produced for trial 
from the Dallas County DA do not match open records. And we do have specific documents. We have in hand, we requested a date, time, everything on those documents, even sent them a copy of one of those documents. They do not exist. And when you get down to the testimony and the investigation of one of the officers, he blatantly admits to his lie. And I will read. So Senior Corporal Smith actually saw the man's body, actually visited the hospital, talked to the nurses, and he concluded that there is no evidence the car ran over Mr. Fred Bradford. Correct. Yes, sir. Answer by Juan Contreras. So there is no evidence that Mr. Bradford ever went underneath the vehicle, is there? No, sir. Then you added possibly underneath the vehicle. Yes, sir. I don't know why I did that. That's wrong. His own words. We have made, my son has made two complaints to the IED here, Internal Affairs. They keep sitting back, nothing's wrong. This man did nothing wrong. Brian went through four years waiting on a trial. That's not due process, four years to the day of the trial. And it was a tragic accident. But the state witness for the DA even said on the stand the DA withheld evidence from him in this case. It's all documented. Everything we have is in print. And we have officers that are retired that will tell you about meetings that went on about this case. And I'm going to push as hard as I can to get this rectified because it was wrong. And if they'll do that to a man in blue that was doing his job, what are they going to do to all of you? and all of these people, whenever the officer lies. And I'm at 100% back to blue. My local sheriff's department out at home, they got my number, I got theirs, something wrong, I call them, they call me. I'll stop and help any officer on the road. <clears throat> but this is wrong, and the Dallas Police Department knows it. <laughs> Sir, now, your time is up. What, what is it that you are asking for the board to do here? I want the board to investigate this case because of the wrongdoing, the falsified documents, the fire department invest, uh, paramedics totally cannot keep their story straight through the whole thing. They falsified a federal document. They need to go to jail. You wouldn't want it done to you. You wouldn't want it done to your family member because they lied and they continued the lie and he finally admitted it. Would you like to file a complaint today, sir? Pardon? Would you like to file a complaint today? We can, uh, I can get a complaint specialist okay. to help you file your complaint. But I appreciate y'all's time. Okay, thank and you. I we'll will, I'm, two, I have tried calling the number for this council. Mm -hmm. I can't get anybody to answer. I have talked to one of the board members, sent her my contact information. I've never received anything. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get you a uh, okay. complaint but specialist it's just tonight. One of those, I, I just can't get nothing in person, you know, over the phone or communication. Yeah, we'll take care of you tonight. And I understand we'll y'all trying to get it set up, but yeah. it's been an issue. <clears throat> right, but we'll take care of you tonight. We'll take care of you tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Y'all have a good evening. D. Holly, District 14. Uh, good evening. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Uh, pretty good. Dallas, Texas. Um, first, I would like to thank Mr. Fortune, Mr. Chairman, and all the other individuals involved in finally um, implementing rules of decorum so we can all feel fa safe to speak. Mm -hmm. um, at the last two, I've been hesitant to speak because at the last two meetings, um, the, it was the, with the aggressive accusations in the room, it was kind of tough. Um, a lot of things have been said about two members of this bo board, both accusations and like you mentioned earlier, threats. But what you haven't heard is how the two of these, these members, um, Mrs. Rodriguez and Mrs. Blackman, have reached out to Mr. Higgins and Mr. Alexander, uh, and they both refused to meet. So I can't see how that's bringing reconciliation or unity to this city. Um, by the way, I was at almost all the town hall meetings that were discussed and that that, that, we, that we discussed the expansion of this board and I heard Mrs. Rodriguez speak many times and never heard or saw any misconduct 
or racially charged statement ever. In fact, she was one of the few who asked how our tax dollars, your tax dollars, would be allocated, and no one could provide that information. She also requested data points on how exactly a board like this has decreased crime in the other 122 cities that have a board, and that too was unavailable. She also volunteered to help the board due to the, what they said there was an over, overwhelming number of complaints, which I think turned out to be 12. As we heard at every town hall meeting in last week, this board is to represent all the community and to address the police, the, the police, the, address the police policy, not to attack individuals or their political beliefs. This board is not even, from what I understand, heard, have, we, they haven't even heard one case yet, and these people are being harassed and dis discriminated against. That sounds a lot like reverse racism to me. This cannot be tolerated, and Mr. Chairman, I applaud you for standing behind each one of these citizens serving on this board. I trust that all cases, not just for black or brown, just like we heard just a minute ago, in this community, to, but to all our community members will be heard, and together you will find reconciliation and, and correct the failing policies that have called, caused Dallas's crime to be at an all-time high. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to thank all of y'all for your service. I know it is uh, out of the um, care of the city of Dallas and ensuring um, justice for all. My name is Susan Fountain. I live in City Council District 10 in Dallas. Good evening. Good evening. I have attended the past two meetings of this new and supposedly improved Community Police Oversight Board. If the chair of this board, the city manager, the assistant city manager, and police chief hall continue to allow a group of thugs led by felons to harass and threaten you all into forcing appointed members from this board, then you are indeed already on a path to failure before you've even had a chance to make it the difference that they demand. That these coalition partners demand that only black and brown people be allowed to serve is in itself racist, and they are guilty of that which they accuse these board members. Our police officers have a tough enough job as it is without these radicalized police haters indoctrinating others to target them. Our crime rates are skyrocketing, and you castigate our law enforcement for trying to keep you safe from yourselves in your own neighborhoods. If there was no crime there, you wouldn't need any police protection. No area in Dallas is completely safe anymore. Even our mayor, who when campaigning in May said that Dallas doesn't have a crime crisis, is now walking back that ill-informed statement and demanding action from our city manager, T.C. Brodnax, and police chief, Renee Hall. I'd like to tell the two members of this board who are, um, have been targeted to stand strong. We support you, and we support all of our men in blue, men and women in blue, very strongly. We appreciate that they put their lives on the line every day for all of us. You have many people who support you. Your presence on this board, it's important to hear your voice as well. Your saner heads will, build, will bring well-rounded discussions to this board and make all of Dallas safer. Those who threaten you should themselves be held accountable and many of us call the rule of order for this board to be allowed to do its job. Thank you all for your service. Thank you. Okay, as you recall from our last meeting, we will receive an update shortly from the subcommittee on the, to develop rules and procedures. The subcommittee is rep recommend, recommending an implementation of speaker guidelines similar to city council and other city boards and commissions. Uh, speakers will be required to sign up at the, at the meeting for public comments at the beginning of meetings similar to city council meetings. Please understand our goal here is to be productive, to have healthy and even spirited dialogue. 
To do so, we must establish some structure on how we engage with one another. Um, and we're saying that, let's go ahead, let's start with the roll. We'll start on the end, state your name and your city council member. Alan Marshall, District 14, David Blewett. Janice Coffey, District 1, Chad West. Andre Turner, District 5, Jaime Rizenzez. Lauren Gilbert Smith, District 4, Carolyn King Arnold. David Kittner, District 13, Jennifer Stallback Gates. Juan Olivo, Place 15, Mayor Johnson. Ezekiel Tyson, District 10, Adam McGrew. D. Wadsworth, District 12, or Kara Mendelson. Christian Hernandez, District 6, Omar Narvaez. Tammy Brown Rodriguez, District 9, Paula Blackman. Jose Rivas, District 7, Adam Basildua. And I'm Jay Swan Robley, now be Carrie Jr., Chair. So next we have uh, approval of the minute, November 12, 2019 minutes. Has the board members, you need time to review them. Janice Coffey, District 1, I move to approve the minutes as written. Second. All right, it's been moved and properly seconded. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, minutes have been approved. Next up is adopting the 2020 meeting schedule. Has everyone had the opportunity to look at the 2020 meeting schedule? Um, if we can entertain a motion to vote on the 2020 meeting schedule. I move, I move that we adopt the schedule as printed. Second. Okay. Um, we need to be any discussion. If not, we'll go ahead and vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 All who oppose? The ayes have it. Okay, We're moving pretty swiftly here. Next up, uh, we'll have a subcommittee update on the development of rules and procedures for the community police oversight board meetings. Kristen Hernandez, District 6 member, will, will provide that information for us. Thank you, Chair. Um, so we met on November 21st and December 2nd. Um, to gather some rules and procedures for how uh, the oversight board would both conduct uh, meetings and uh, as well as be able to receive speakers. Um, and so everyone should have a copy of that in their binder, um, but just was gonna go through and highlight some points um, for discussion as well. Um, the chair would, be appo uh, would appoint a sergeant at arms and a deputy to enforce compliance. Uh, we'll have a board secretary who would oversee the clerical work and would be under the direction and supervision of the police monitor. Um, we would be meeting at least once a month um, and to bring agenda items forward, we'd have three members request um, that those be brought forward and at least 100 hours in advance of the day of the meeting. Uh, we also, I'm just going through some of the main points. Um, for any speakers that wish to address a specific agenda item, um, they need to register with the board secretary by 5 p.m. the day before a scheduled board meeting in the same way that you would for a city council meeting. However, there is not a need to register to speak ahead of time for the open speakers uh, section of the meeting, which we will have at every meeting. Um, we did establish some committees, uh, some standing committees, a uh, committee for board training where we've received training um, for things that are germane to our service on the board, policy review, community engagement, and rules, which was the subcommittee that um, the three of us were directing this from. Uh, I think that is, those are the main points for discussion. Is the board prepared to, to vote on this today? Is there, is there a discussion that needs to take place? Any questions in regards to the board rules? David Kittner, um, we just received these uh, today and, and I have not had a chance to study them, though they appear to be 
for the most part reasonable and appropriate. I would like the opportunity to study them and, and be able to provide some uh, comments and that we uh, look at them the next time we meet in January. Okay, would someone like to, to make a motion to table this item to the next board meeting? Um, Tammy Brown Rodriguez, District 9. I move that we table this discussion to the next meeting. Then properly moved and seconded. All in favor of tabling the discussion of the board rules to the next meeting? Please. Aye. 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 All who oppose? Ayes have it. So this will be tabled until the January meeting. Um, next up is consideration of directing the director of Office of Community Police Oversight to initiate an independent investigation concerning the Diamond Ross incident. Um, as everyone knows, we currently do not have a director of office, the director for the Office of Police Oversight. But does anyone have any questions or concerns around this before a motion is made? Mr. Chair, when you uh, mentioned director, is that the same as the monitor? Yeah, that'd be the same as the monitor. Anyone else have a question? You can raise your hand. Recognize by the chair. I move to initiate an independent investigation and hire an outside investigator concerning the Diamond Ross incident in accordance with Chapter 37 of the Dallas City Code pending. Completion of all findings and recommendations of the Internal Affairs Division. The final decision within the police department determining what, if any, disciplinary action will be taken. The conclusion of any claim or civil litigation involving the incident or complaint. And if grand jury proceedings are anticipated, the conclusion of all jan grand jury proceedings relating to the incident or complaint. I second the motion. It's been properly moved and seconded. <clears throat> um, is there any discussion? Just a quick question. Is this in addition to uh, it, once we have the OPO monitor in place and they want to do their investigation as well, we're recommending a third party investigation or is this through the OPO as stated? So this is, so because of the fact that we don't have right. the, uh, the monitor, this, will, this would allow us through the ordinance to do the in independent investigation. We just do one independent investigation. My, that, that was my question as well. Are we going to hire somebody to do what the monitor would do if the monitor was in place? Yes. Uh, why, why would we do that if we are interviewing the monitor and we expect to have one in place fairly soon? That is a good question. The thing is that we don't know when the monitor will be hired. However, this allows, say for instance the monitor is hired at the end of the week then the monitor may, the monitor still may not be able to start until, say they can't start until February. We owe it to this family to not have them waiting until February to get answers. So that's why we're gonna go ahead, and that's why the motion was made. So that we get the monitor and they're hired, great. If not, we still have this option to do the independent investigation. Is, is there, I, I don't mean to interrupt, is there an ability, because uh, I'm, I'm, I'm in favor of doing this, is there a way to structure it so that once the OPO monitor is in place, that they can then join this investigation? So we're not having one investigation that's done independently, and then the OPO is going to want to perform their duty as well. And so then you end up having parallel investigations going on, which could become a problem. Right. So instead of forcing that separation, if there's a way to start this and then have the OPO join once he's or her, once they're put in place. And it definitely um, can be discussed. This is just giving a framework so that we can get the ball rolling on the independent investigation. Well, I, I, I would have the same thoughts uh, in terms of if we have a monitor, and I, I understand what you're saying, and I, I don't disagree with undue delay. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if the monitor is going to be in place within the next four to six weeks, and, and again, I don't have any information on that, but uh, and we're going to go out and spend some additional dollars and then have to take it back because the monitor should be doing this. 
I would like to have some sort of limitations in terms mm -hmm. of when the, in, in the other investigator would begin or that the monitor, our monitor, would take the case back completely. Okay. It, seems, it doesn't seem economical or reasonable to have two different cases going at the same time. Right, and we won't have two different investigations. We'll, this is just to, to, to start the ball rolling on the investigation. And Mr. Mr. Chair, I have a yes. question. Mm -hmm. um, so do we have a particular allocation on the budget for the, the price point of what a third party investigation would be? Now that, um, we do have money budgeted for independent investigations. Even if we had a monitor, the monitor still could hire outside investigations. So there's money in the budget for that. Now, again, as I stated, this is just to lay out the framework so we can get the ball rolling. This is not giving, in, giving out a blank check and spending. This is just to give the framework so we can get started. And so once we decide if this is the, the way we're going to go, then we would ha get bids. Is that how we select who would be the independent um, investigator? Now, that is a question that I cannot answer. That may be John. Thank you, sir. Uh, John Fortune, Assistant City Manager. And so the, the budget does have funding in it for independent investigations. And so um, what we would do for an outside firm such as this that would come in would handle this like we would hiring an outside law firm through the city attorney's office they would engage their um, process which um, depending on the, the price that's quoted they would get some some professional qualifications from people and make sure that they're in hiring an, a person of, or a firm with the qualifications appropriate for this type of investigation then they would make a decision about engaging them. But this motion as it was structured was to allow the board to direct us to move forward with that. It's not contemplated that the monitor would necessarily have to do every independent investigation. That is certainly something that they could do. But in this particular instance, there was some urgency that we heard from the board at your last meeting that you wanted to start this. And so this motion allows us to go ahead and engage an outside consultant to uh, initiate that investigation. Should we have the monitor on board within the next few weeks or month, they certainly can be a part of overseeing that contract with that firm. And at any point in time they feel like they want to take that over, they can. If not, because they um, may feel that the firm is doing everything they can do to uh, uh, implement that investigation appropriately, they can choose to allow them to complete it and then bring it to you um, with their input at the end of the conclusion of that investigation. Just a follow-up question with that. And then with the, um, the budget, who then approves the particular um, quotes that we receive? Is it the city it manager approve it? Well, the city attorney would provide um, that uh, recommendation to the city manager, and the city manager then would authorize that. Since that's a department, the Office of Community Police Oversight would, is really a department of the city manager's division. It's a division of his office. Um, he would have the ultimate authority to approve or not approve that. Gotcha. Thank you. Are there any other questions from the board? Are we prepared to vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. One thing I will, I just want to add that I think that being physical Fiscal responsibility is important. However, you cannot place a price tag on someone's life. And I think that we need to be very careful in our discussions because of the fact that we will be dealing with some very sensitive topics. And I just want to state that for a victim, there is no amount of money that will replace their lost loved one. So I think we need to be very careful and very mindful in our, and very deliberate in our conversations. But we'll move on. Uh, next we have our um, monthly activity report. It's me again, John Fortune, Assistant City Manager. Wanted to take a few minutes and the chair had asked me to present to the board an activity report and admittedly up front I'd like to tell you that this is something that your monitor will do when that individual has been hired and I'll give you an update on that process here in just a few minutes but um, uh, what, it, what I'd like to do is if I could get on the screen here for you to see 
And this is not the presentation. I just got to Pardon me for just a moment. Well, I apologize. Um, we apparently don't have that presentation as uh, we anticipated. Um, in your backup, though, for this item is the flow chart. And I um, wanted to describe for you the process for how complaints are, are, are made and how they, what happens to them once they're made. And then in, at the end of this, I'll show you the report for the month of October that kind of gives you a sense of how many complaints we've received and where they have been, uh, how they've been handled up to this point. So as you know, per the ordinance, as a complaint can come in from multiple places, can come in through the Office of Community Police Oversight, which is a new opportunity for residents to make a complaint against a police officer, but they can also make a complaint against uh, a police officer directly with the police department, either by going to one of the substations, going directly to uh, IED at the Jack Evans headquarters, or submit that via mail or email or any other way in which they would like to do so. Um, those investigations, when uh, they come in, will be centralized for the monitor to take a look at and sit down in, in cons consultations with the administrative division, in administrative affairs uh, division commander, then make a determination as to what we should do with those complaints. Some complaints come in, um, for example, that are issues of law that are for a judge to decide, not necessarily whether or not the officer did something inappropriate. Um, they may be complaining about um, they, they, di they didn't believe that the officer should have arrested them because they didn't have the, the, the contraband on them or something of that nature. And those are really not issues for the um, monitor or the police department to investigate. That's what the courts are for. We also get We also get complaints about, um, believe it or not, um, officers from other agencies that are really not under our purview. Um, or we will get an, an investigation, and the monitor would, would a complaint. The monitor would take a look at the um, dash body uh, body cam or dash cam video, and and quickly be able to assess that there was nothing um, that is to investigate as it relates to that particular complaint. So that's a process that will occur um, through the monitor's office, through the Office of Community Police Oversight going forward. Um, however, uh, we don't have a monitor right now, and so um, as complaints come in, um, that process is still being handled as we have been under our past practices until that monitor position is hired. So there are four categories for those complaints to be addressed. One is for it to be in an internal affairs investigation, and that is where um, the uh, ordinance calls for the IED um, division to conduct that investigation and for it to be monitored through that process by the Office of Community Police Oversight. Those would be your more serious infractions. Those would be something that might result in formal discipline of a police officer. Then there are those minor um, type of complaints. Maybe it's a courtesy challenge or it's an issue about being uh, the officer was rude. The monitor may realize or may assess through this process that that individual um, has a legitimate complaint but it doesn't rise to the level of some type of formal di discipline. And so those are, are, are referred to back to the police department in what's called a division referral. So somewhere in the chain of command for that particular officer, depending on where that, that uh, violation or that infraction occurred, the supervisor of that officer would take the appropriate time to look into that case and then make a, a division uh, decision about discipline at that time for that officer. Then of course, there's those other categories that I mentioned at the beginning which were um, based on the facts or circumstances that were provided in the original complaint that no investigation is going to move forward. And then finally, the new um, category that is really something that is, I think, has some opportunity for some um, good outcome for both residents and the police department is the opportunity for mediation. Of course, we don't have that process set up. This is something that's very important that we set up once we have the monitor so we can ensure that we're following a, a kind of an independent process to do that. So if I could, I'll refer you to the, um, the report itself. You can see that through, for the month of October, we had uh, 90 complaints come into the police department directly. Um, 42 of those came from email, eight were from letters, and then we had 40 that were from walk-ins. 
During that same time frame, we had five complaints that were made directly at the Office of Community Police Oversight. Um, there were um, two that were from an external email. One was from a letter that we received. One was from an online form that we have um, available on the, on the website, and there was one walk-in. So that was a total of 95 complaints that were provided to uh, against uh, police officers during the month of October. So um, if you'll go to the next page, you'll see that there were division referrals uh, for 28 of those complaints. There were 10 of those that were assigned internal affairs investigations, and then the balance of the rest were those that were allocated to one of those categories that they didn't meet the criteria, or they were a duplicate complaint, or some of those other um, explanations that are provided as to why the investigation didn't occur. So what we would contemplate each month is that you would have this report. Um, as IED investigations for these complaints are concluded, the monitor then will present you the results of those IED investigations. And that is this body's um, chance and that opportunity for your monitor to present to you their assessment. We believe that the police department was fair in its investigation. We believe that they conducted this investigation with the all diligence and professionalism and to the integrity and the detail that was necessary to get to a conclusion. It was thorough, those type of things. If at uh, any time this board, once the monitor makes that report of findings to you at the close of an IED investigation, then it would be in your purview then to direct um, uh, an independent investigation if you don't believe those findings were sufficient. And that's the way the process has been established through the new ordinance. And that's really kind of what you guys have done with the previous item this evening. And so I just wanted to give you, the chair, chairman had asked me to give you an, uh, kind of an overview of how that works. And so that the number one, the community can understand it. And then we will come each month to you with a, a report on the previous month's activity. And I envision that when the monitor is on board, you will ultimately have the, um, the, 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 the full cycle of this complete so that you can get those independent reports based on the monitoring that's occurred during the investigations. So with that, I'll stop and answer any questions that you may have. All right, raise your hand and the chair will recognize you if you have questions. Okay, let's see here. Mrs. Um, Wadsworth. Wadsworth, I'm sorry, I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, Mr. Fortune, I had a question about the volume of complaints you received in October. You said you got 90 through the Dallas police system and yeah. you got five through our office. Is that a 95, is that an ordinary amount of complaints? Is it high, is it low? I, that's that's average average okay thank you Ms. Rodriguez yes um, I had a question about how many active total officers there are in the Dallas City County um, there are three approximately 3,000 active police active officers. Duty. okay thank you mr. Rivas I have a question regarding the feedback loop on uh, this workflow process mm -hmm. Specifically, uh, once, once a division referral or an IA or a non-investigation occurs, <clears throat> how, does that, how does that information get back to the resident um, and to the OCPO and sure, the board? Sure. Each resident is contacted about the outcome of their investigation by the entity that's conducting that investigation. In this case, most of, that, most of these are handled by the police department under this current uh, ordinance, the way it's established. Um, those complaints that are division referrals, um, they aren't really par purview of this board to direct a different outcome. However, we are required to come to you and to the monitor and attest that they were addressed. So, for example, if the monitor is suggesting that's a division referral, we don't just leave it at that. We're going to be coming back to the monitor to indicate that, that that particular investigation was resolved and that these are the findings. And that's, uh, that's the closed back, back loop on the referrals. As it relates to internal affairs investigations, that'll be a report back to this body by your monitor. Now, I don't envision that they'll go into the details of each of those cases, now they may, but I do believe that there'll be you know, some opportunity for you to ask questions and get into the level of information you feel is necessary to be able to make a judgment about what you wanna do next. But the director, or the monitor will have the insight on yes, the, what the, occurred. Yes, the ordinance allows that monitor and, and contemplates that that monitor will be sitting down and getting into the level of detail that they believe is necessary um, following the, the standards of the ordinance. 
to be able to assess and monitor that investigation. Okay. Um, follow up on that one, if I may, Chair. Um, Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Regarding mediation, mm -hmm. it, I'm all for mediation. It kind of seems out of place in where it's at in the workflow process, meaning isn't mediation kind of we acknowledge or don't acknowledge necessarily well, it, the that ordinance, something happened? It was, it, was, it was established in the ordinance that mediation is a new option because you, you just, take a, just take a rudeness complaint or something where the officer, um, it, it, it's a complaint against the officer that they treated somebody poorly or they didn't do what they were, should have done. Um, mediation is, is, first of all, it's, volu it's voluntary. The, it has to be requested by the complainant and it has to be agreed to by the police officer. If those two conditions exist, and then an, a third party mediation is an opportunity for people sometimes just to sit down and kind of work through an understanding about what happened, um, why did the officer have to do this, or why this was said, or, or whatever disagreement there may be as a result of that particular complaint. And it's really intended to be a different avenue for conflict resolution as opposed to everything being a complaint against somebody that rises to the level of an IED investigation or even a division referral. All right, we may have to revisit that one. I may have more questions on that one. Can I have a follow-up? Go ahead. So if you have to have it, it's voluntary by the officer and by the complainant, and the officer decides they have no interest, where does it go from there? Well, the complainant, they would have, I would assume the complainant would probably decide, well, I'm going to make a formal complaint. And um, then the monitor then would help assess where so that complaint would go directly to the monitor. That's correct. And not necessarily in the, the monitor is involved in overseeing this process, and that's why, quite so frankly, it's not been put in place just yet. I have another question, if I may, Chair. Um, so, will the will we have opportunity to review all of the cases that go through the monitor? The board has the ability to review the independent investigations and the findings that come from the independent investigations. The monitor is your, your arms and legs to be able to assess whether that investigation is being done correctly and if it's being handled the way that you feel it should be handled. So, so we, you won't necessarily, um, those cases aren't presented to you for a finding from you. Those cases are presented to the monitor for the monitor then to make a determination and then present their findings to you. But we do have access to that information yes. of what's being you, okay. you would be at, at access. So, some of it, there will be some that you may not because of some, some uh, confidence, if it's, a, if it's under a criminal investigation or some of those other aspects, then there will be some limitations. It's the only way it seems like you have a question. Okay. Thanks. Um, just to clarify, because you did mention that parts of it would be uh, confidential. If there are complaints against an officer that are repeated, that are, you know, multiple complaints over the course of time, where would that be shown? Would it be within the police monitor? Or would that be reflected in reports? I'm not sure I understand the question. Are you saying you want to know if, if a complaint comes in against an individual officer, you'd like to know how many complaints they have received from previous? Yes. Um, I'll, I'll have to investigate that question and, and answer to that question. I don't know at this point how that would work, and I okay. can certainly get back to you with that. Thanks. I have a question, Mr. Chair. Uh, who else had a question? I, 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 go, go ahead, sir. Uh, I want to back, uh, backtrack a bit. Um, who or where do the uh, subpoena powers uh, come in place? Um, those would come in, into, into play if there was an independent investigation and there was a need for your monitor to come and suggest that they need some support getting a witness to come in and talk. Uh, so the monitor has that, that power and Well, it, well the, the subpoena has to come from this body. The monitor would recommend to you. Got it. Okay. Um, and so going back to these uh, total external complaints by source, um, I'm not sure why the reason you know, for these lopsided numbers, uh, you know, the DPD's uh, total is 90 and you know, the Office of uh, Community Police Use Oversight is, is 5. Uh, I'm not sure why the, the, the numbers are the way they are. 
um, when can we be briefed or, or given a heads up as to when all of our phone numbers or websites and all that good stuff is, is up and running? So, so there is a website up and running. There is a, there is a staff person in the Office of Community okay. Police Oversight that handles uh, residents as they come in and they also uh, handle the phone. So the gentleman that spoke earlier, I'll just have to research particularly to make sure they were calling the right number. And so I've got his name, we'll do that. But as of October 1, there was a website presence. We've actually provided some um, information for people for frequently asked questions, um, trying to make it as convenient and as, as helpful as possible. I've shared all this information with the chair to kind of make sure from his perspective um, that's representing you that you guys are comfortable with the level of detail and what we're putting on. I expect this is a start and evolution of additional, um, we'll build on this and there'll be additional information and maybe even more, com uh, more complex uh, ability for people to access and see information directly online. Yeah. Now as it relates to the level of complaints coming directly to the police department uh, versus the Office of Community Police Oversight, you've got to remember the Office of Community Police Oversight didn't exist prior to October. And so I think that's really part of another item on this agenda is for you to talk about community engagement. And I think the purpose is of that topic is for this board to be involved in making and educating um, awareness around the fact that there is the Office of Community Police Oversight. So I would expect that that's really more of a, a factor of a new, new entity, a new process that the public's trying to get used to. And over time, I would expect that that, would, that, would, that balance probably would shift the other way. Yeah, hopefully the five is a good indicator. Uh, of it. Um, another question on that, uh, do we know if, uh, if uh, language barrier issues were present in the filing of these uh, complaints and uh, do we have um, anybody in the office that speaks uh, a second language that could probably be able to help them um, filing? I, 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 believe, I believe there is someone who can speak uh, Spanish in the office right now. That's or a temporary, temporary situation but that, that will change um, as the monitor is hired and they hire their staff. Um, you got to remember, we're hiring a monitor, and then the monitor then is going to hire their staff. And so there's yeah, still yeah. some buildup that's going to occur yeah. after we hire the monitor. Yeah, just not, not just Spanish, but any other second language. Oh. That'd, be, that'd be great. Uh, sure, we, ha we have, have language lines and access to other resources to help us should someone contact us who um, doesn't speak English and then we try to, to get them uh, addre their issues addressed. Great. Thank you, Assistant Manager. Any additional questions on the board? Thank, Thank you. you. All right, so, so next we have um, review actions and requests from our prior meetings. I mean, John, are you handling that piece too? Yes, I sat down too quickly, didn't I? Sorry about that. So this item is, is placed on your agenda for a couple of reasons. I, um, we, we had discussed at your last meeting um, some uh, implicit bias training for the board. We, we solicited some dates from the, the board and January 16th was that um, the date that was selected. And so what we've provided for you in your packets is an overview, is just a confirmation that that's the date. It'll be um, from 6 to 8.30 p.m. on January 16th. And we will send you prior to then a location um, where that will be, be held. But I wanted to kind of make sure that we confirm that for you. Then um, also in this item, uh, as you know, we've talked to you previously about the importance of open records and open meetings. And so what um, the city attorney's office ha has done is they've provided for us kind of a presentation that kind of highlights the details, uh, the high details about the requirements for open records and open meetings. And um, we're here to just address your questions rather than going through a long presentation over that tonight. We wanted to give that to you so that if you have questions then we can certainly address that for you. And then finally, we have um, some information that we provided just on gifts and ethics and things like that that help you help educate you on the city standards that we follow for other boards and commissions and for staff in the city council. So that's this item, and I just wanted to present that to you from that perspective. Then the last item, the last um, update that I would tell you is that um, we are in the process of conducting interviews for the monitor this week. Um, tomorrow we will have um, convened panels that were um, established to provide some kind of community input and stakeholder input into the selection of 
into the interview process for the, the four finalists that we have named. We had five, um, one is withdrawn, and so we're down to four. And then following the panel interviews tomorrow, um, there will be a reception, and the, of course the invitation has gone to this board for you to, to attend that reception and um, get to meet the candidates. We've sent you kind of a biography, kind of a short biography on each of the candidates. And then on Thursday, the chair, chairman and myself will interview the, the, each of the individuals that um, are, have been selected as finalists. And then, then from there, um, we contemplate that there will be a recommendation of some um, one or two top candidates that would be presented to the city manager for him to interview and then make a final selection on, with, in, in, uh, with participation by the chair through that process the, the entire time. So I wanted to kind of give you an update. We are very hopeful that um, this process this week will reveal um, a finalist, somebody that rises to the top fairly quickly and that we can um, get to a place of, of, of filling that position and have that individual on board by the first of the year. So with that, Chairman, I'll, I'll, I'll stand for questions. If not, we can go to the next item. Okay. Uh, go ahead, uh, sir. Is, is there any waiting period once you make the offer and, uh, and that you have to post it or anything of that nature? No, sir, there's no waiting period. So if you make a job offer, say, Friday or Monday, and it's accepted, then the person can start at their... We, 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 would, we would follow a professional decorum that usually allows an individual to give an appropriate amount of time sure. of notice. Uh, if they're relocating from another... There's a lot of factors that we have to consider in, in establishing that time frame. Of course, we'll be pushing for as soon as possible, but uh, we, we are obviously looking for a long-term good fit and not a quick resolution that, you know, makes somebody unhappy because we rushed them too quick. So I want to, you know, we'll take all those things into consideration. I, I noticed that the, the four candidates, I don't know who the fifth one was, but the four candidates were all lawyers. Is that, was that the predominant background of the people who applied? That, that was part of, uh, part of, you know, there was elements of, of having a legal background that were part of the job requirements. And um, just so this board would know, the, there was uh, about 80 applicants. We took those that met the minimum qualifications and presented them to the city manager and to the chairman, and they selected these finalists. And so that's how that process had occurred. Thank you very much. You bet. Any additional questions? Yes, sir, uh, on the, uh, the board training, the open meetings, um, is there any type of um, timeline that comes about when there's uh, open records requests for a, a timeline for, uh, for you to get the training or for us to respond for us to respond yeah there Casey do you mind just giving a quick overview of the response requirements for the city this is Casey yes. Burgess is assistant city attorney yeah it's typically a 10-day response time any other questions from the board when you say 10 days, that uh, request goes to the city or to the board, and it, we have 10 days to respond to that request, correct? So, so what we need to clarify that if you're somewhere and someone asks you for information about something, you know, you're going to need to direct them to the monitor. The monitor then would then be the individual to help this individual through this process. Typically, open record requests are made through the city secretary's office. And we do that so that, number one, we can log the, the request, but ensure that we respond to it in the appropriate amount of time. Any additional questions? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so the next to last action item is dealing with board member update on community engagement activities. We can just go around the table and, and board members can just talk about what they've been doing so far to educate the community on, on this new board. And it, it could be anything. It could be interviews. It could be speaking at community um, meetings. Like anything where you've been engaged in the community. And, and for those new board members who may not have anything, you can, you can, you can pass. This is my first meeting, and I was voted on after the last meeting, so I'm, I've not quite jumped into the uh, community engagement just yet. Perfectly understandable. I've spoken with people at the uh, Heritage Oak Cliff meeting uh, Monday night, and also my neighborhood meeting, which happened last week. 
definitely. This is my first board meeting, so I'm trying to get fully educated on it. I have not had a public uh, opportunity, but I have a couple of things scheduled with the city council Mormon and at my church. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have anything to report at this time. Uh, that I, I have nothing to report, but I look forward to, uh, to having this, uh, these rules established so that uh, we can establish this, this committee on community engagement to have something to, to, to say. I participated in a town hall with Congressman Allred in our district or his district and uh, did a magazine interview, you know. Big time. So I outlined the many ways that people can um, file a complaint, the multiple routes we have for filing a complaint, and that's gone out in the newsletter for my um, city council member, Mendelson. Mm -hmm. Nothing to report. I have spoken to multiple groups in District 9 in regards to what we're up to and the changes and the importance of participation and activity in the CPOB, as well as activating and engaging with their city council member. Uh, Paula Blackman and I are looking at her calendar and developing a game plan so that we have a monthly item for me to be able to reach out to my community in District 9. Thank you, Chair. Jose Rivas, District 7. <clears throat> I attended Austin Design Week um, and met with the Director of uh, Office of Police Oversight in November um, in collaboration with Austin Tech Alliance for uh, developing customer-based forms specifically for police oversight and uh, from a board and monitor perspective on how that could, how we interact with the residents. Um, I also uh, have attended a monthly meeting with my councilman at Juanita Craft Recreation Center regarding public safety. <clears throat> I also have a uh, Facebook site for District 7, CBOP, and a Twitter account. All of those have accurate phone numbers linked to the complaint on the uh, city's website, and um, I think that's about it. Thank you. So I've I'll say something, man. The, the media is just, I had the flu one day, and it was like, hey, can we do an interview? I said, well, I'm just leaving the doctor's office. Okay, well, we can meet you somewhere. So um, I have done a few interviews. I've gone to a few um, District 3 community meetings and spoke. I've spoken at um, Casey Thomas's leader leadership um, breakfast that he does every month. Um, I've spoken with members of my fraternity. Actually, I've spoken with them throughout the, the process of this, getting this board established. I've um, met with other community groups as well. So next up is open mic for public comment. Um, we will have Let's see, right now it is 6.43. So we basically have 45 minutes. We'll give everyone three minutes each until the clock strikes 7.30. Um, let me give you some rules again, just to remind everyone. State your name and address for the record. You're gonna address only me, not individual board members. You will not mention any board members by name. You will not threaten board members. You will not threaten to come to their homes. You will not th threaten to come to their places of work. Uh, this is public comment, not public conversation. So the conversation may just be one-sided with you giving comments. We're going to observe the same rules of, of uh, decorum and good conduct applicable to members of the city council. Making personal, impertinent, profane, and slanderous remarks or becoming boisterous while addressing, the, while addressing the board will result in in your speaking privilege being taken away from you for the remaining of this session. Only one person may approach the microphone at any one time and only that person at the microphone will be allowed to speak. 
and we will be mind the audience will be respectful to the speakers as well. And with that, we will get started. Speaker number one. Are we ready? Yes, we're ready. Okay. My name is Dr. Pamela Grayson, 6812 Wilhelmina Drive, Dallas, Texas. I am here, first of all, I appreciate your decorum as well, but I noticed it wasn't stopped when we were called thugs. If somebody's gonna call me a thug, please do write and call me Dr. Thug. Secondly, it was also stated that Changa and Dominique, who will speak for himself, were called, were reached out to by two members of this board. I immediately picked up the phone and I called Changa Higgins. That is a bold-faced lie. Now, the two members that are saying this, we're supposed to have trust in them. We already don't want you here. But then we gonna get up here and lie. I am point blank asking for an investigation into that statement. They need to provide proof of where they have reached out to do these two individuals or they need to accept that they have lied and I expect repercussions for that. To get up here and lie is not how this needs to start. We are messing up already. Compromising character and integrity which should be the foundation of this very board for everyone. Again, if you don't wanna be here and you don't intend to do right, leave. Again, I want an investigation into those comments. I want proof that Changa was reached out to. Proof that Dominique was reached out to. Otherwise, these people need to eat the lies that they've told. My name is Dr. Grayson. And again, if you're gonna call me a thug, make sure you say Dr. Thug Grayson. Thank you. You know, um, once my great-grandmother said, when I was about 10 years old at a family reunion to a group of us, that the truth would set you free. She also said that lies will equal bondage and corruption. My name is Carol Harrison Lafayette. I live on the Grand Prairie side. Uh, Casey Thomas is the city council. I, I have gotten out of the hospital a few days ago from bronchitis but I could not miss this day. I am very mad. I'm very angry. I'm very disappointed. I hold a lot of pain here today because I depended on the Dallas policeman to help me with my son, Clayton Harrison, who went into the military. He served in the military. He got out on the military on honorable discharge because he got hurt in the military and suffers from PTSD. PTSD is real. My son does not have a criminal record. He was having a mental breakdown on August the 3rd, 2019. I called the hospital, Hickory Trail. The nurse told me, call to get some assistance with the police to help get him out there. I called the non-emergency number for Dallas, explained that my son, Clayton, was having a mental breakdown, that he went into the military, he was hurt, he got on an honorable discharge, and I needed to get him to the hospital. Well, I asked for a sergeant also, because I'm thinking that a sergeant would know how to handle somebody who had, suffers from mental illness. When they got out there, they body slammed my son. I had paperwork in my hand showing that he suffered from mental illness. My, I didn't, that call was not for criminal. They charged my son for assaulting three police officers. It was nine white officers that showed up. My son was sent to Lusteric instead of a mental hospital. They lied on a police report. The bond was $90,000. What mother who is single who dialed 911 to get assistance for their child has that kind of money in, in this day's economy. I didn't have $90,000. I didn't get any ha help from any activists, no leaders, no nobody. I put it on social media, reaching out for help. God help me. Because I got a phone call after five months of him being incarcerated, the Dallas County Jail. To top that off, he was put in the general population and his hand was broke in the, in, in the cell, cell door. It was broke. Five 
five months in jail behind a lie. On top of that, the sergeant lied on him. Three, two of the officers dropped charges. You know what the attorney told me in the DA? They never ever seen officers drop charges for assault, but they did. The sergeant is the only one that didn't. An independent investigator told me that that sergeant is getting disability. He was been a sergeant, a police officer for 30 years in Dallas. He said that my son kicked him in the groin. Now, I did a complaint with Eternal Affairs. I got a letter the next day. Uh, 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 the next day, they concluded their investigation, and when I did get the letter, they said that nothing, nothing, nothing was done wrong, but yet the officers dropped. I want justice for my son. He has a criminal record. Just last week, the attorney called, and the DA told me that they're not going to press charges against him. They're not going to go with the case. They're going to give him a, um, a conditional bond. They put him on one year, one year. He can't even work, and he served for this country. My son wants to work, and he wants a job. I want justice for my son. He suffers from PTSD, and any one of you all are candidates. Excuse me, ma'am. mental illness. And I want justice for Clayton Harrison because he did not deserve to get arrested. I'm standing in the voice for the young men who were killed across our country because police officers are saying they fear for their lives. My son is alive. Okay, ma'am, I'm you sorry. You all know a... that if my son would have assaulted three police officers, he would have been murdered. They would have tased him. But instead, they gave him charges, investigated and get justice for Clayton Harrison. Excuse me, do you, do you want to file a complaint today? Okay, yes, we can, we can take care of you. We can get um, Victoria to take care of you, okay? I'll try to do my best to follow up on that one. But I, I will uh, like to add the fact that uh, what we are trying to look for as citizens, we're trying to finally realize that we're trying to be taken seriously. I uh, have filed several complaints against uh, police because it seems like they have a sense of preferential treatment toward who they uh, tend to as far as uh, getting diligence done and then others just simply get ignored. I have filed several complaints against uh, a neighbor that was uh, that, that started off by trying to attack my dad, then he uh, got in my mother's face, and then eventually he got to me after I had already told him it wasn't going to be happening anymore. I have uh, filed uh, an, a lawsuit because the same neighbor called the police and then notified 311 about, about my cars being parked in front of my house and in front of other neighbors' houses as if he had a right to file any type of complaint. I understand the city ordinance about the 24-hour rule. I've read it. I've looked it over, just like I also overlooked the, what the, uh, I looked over the, uh, what the preference is for qualified immunity. But when police officers take it upon themselves to break the law blatantly and then hide behind that, that puts us all in a very bad bind because we're trying to be citizens out here trying to live a life normal as, as, as it already is for whatever normalcy. But then to have police officers take your vehicles just because they feel like they can, or they feel like they're entitled because they have a badge, I just think that just puts a black eye on everything that we're trying to do here. And I think the main thing we got to get back to is a simple words called integrity. Seems like it's not working these days. You know, when you call and file complaints and finally the police come back after six months of me complaining, they came over to the house uh, last Friday to ask us, what can we do for you? So after six months, I guess nothing. Fortunately, no one died this time. But we also know about other cases where people have died. I have uh, here the videos of the incident where the police came over to the house putting a sticker on there and then would they didn't want to come out to, for me to show them that the cars work. And I, uh, then I also got on the video the neighbor that caused the incident coming out trying to pick a fight. And nothing was done when I uh, reported this incident. And like I said, this was three separate incidents that I reported and nothing being done. 
internal affairs give it a run around, mayor's office give it a run around, but then they get mad at me because I sued them. Well, gave me no choice. And as I will be telling them tomorrow, I will keep coming until something is done. So I'll uh, be having a meeting with the assistant city manager here in a moment to see if we can get something started. So uh, thank you. And uh, I'm Reggie Ruffin, Just Cause Coalition. Thank you, sir. You, you filed a, a complaint in the last meeting, didn't you? Yes, I did. Okay, has anyone followed up with you? Have you uh, received the email? No. <laughs> okay, we'll, 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 we'll follow up, okay? Right. Thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah abdul Matulab. I'm from District 1. Mm -hmm. um, I want to just repeat my comments quickly, kind of echoing before um, my disappointment that there are board members who have publicly stated that they do not believe in oversight. But I had a, f a few questions. I was wondering if I could address questions to you. Um, it's really public comments. So. Okay, comment slash questions. Yeah. So um, I was wondering if the rules related to the meeting decorum um, and just rules about meetings, are those posted publicly? Um, and I had asked previously if there would be an opportunity for the public to actually provide feedback on those rules. Um, so I, it seems like the board just got them today, but would, since that has been delayed, would we be able to see what is being proposed so that we could address those items at the next meeting? Uh, they should have been a part of the agenda okay. that was posted. Okay, great. Um, and then I find a, that there's a problem with not being able to mention board members by name. It doesn't seem like that's relevant at all. I get not name calling, um, but it doesn't seem like that's an efficient way <laughs> um, to go about things. Um, I also think that there should be a portion of the meeting um, or some accountability to, for us to be able to learn about certain board members' positions on things, whether that's through questions that we write down and ask them in advance, but I feel like they should be publicly accountable for answering some questions. Um, and uh, will there be a, it seems like there will be a committee for community engagement, and when will that start meeting? Or what are the details with that? Um, we, we, the board is reviewing the, the board rules. That, that, is, that is a part of the board rules, though, establishing that committee. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. got it. Um, just a suggestion, I think that once that is in place, um, I think that there should be a central place for any of the public events um, so that there is some accountability and just awareness uh, for the community of what's going on so um, that it's just across districts in case people want to attend ones in other districts that they may not, you know, may not know about. Um, and also I feel like that committee should address um, some type of requirement for the number and type of events that each district holds, um, that some of them are should be open to the public and well advertised and promoted. Um, I think that's all my comments for now. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Callie Cohn. Uh, I'm a, a district resident of Council Member Medrano's district. I want to thank the board uh, for taking the action today to investigate uh, Diamond Ross's death. Uh, I, I think it's an important use of your powers and an important way to inaugurate this board. Uh, I would like to ask, though, uh, that the board uh, consider the way that it has it, uh, that it has started the investigation. I think when we hear about the frustrations from the community about time and time over what has happened, um, what we hear about is oftentimes frustration that there is a conclusion that nothing was done wrong in accordance with department procedure or policy. And so one of the important powers that this board has is to look at departmental procedure and policy and say, is this in line with best practice? Is this in line with our community's values? And is this upholding the life and dignity of everybody here in Dallas? And so I would ask this board to consider directly asking its investigator not only to consider the sort of the investigation of her death and whether it complied with departmental procedure and protocol, but also whether the departmental procedure and protocol that uh, is applicable in the case is appropriate. Uh, the second thing that I'd like to mention is that uh, there has been a lot of discussion at, at these meetings about uh, public safety and uh, the crime rate in Dallas and uh, the, the the resources of the police department. 
And as an oversight body over the police department, I believe this body has a role in evaluating what the police department is being asked to do and whether, uh, whether uh, I would say to the board that public safety uh, is not governed only by the police department. There have been meetings convened across the city of Dallas by Councilmember Thomas and others about the many reasons uh, related to uh, historic and chronic underfunding of particular areas and particular needs in the city uh, that are contributing to what we're seeing uh, from a public safety perspective. The police are being asked to do far too much, um, and I believe it's this body's role to to make recommendations about uh, about what is an appropriate role for public safety in this city and where the city should be resourcing other places so that the police department isn't having to take on every public safety issue here in Dallas. Thank you very much uh, for all of your work and for the time. Thank you. Hi, I'm Indiana Taylor. I am... 9626 uh, Delgade, Dallas, Texas. I wanted to say last time I was a little upset, so I apologize for that. I do mean what I said, but I mean it in a, meant it in a different way. Uh, I won't mention any names, but I do want to mention their words. Disband the Citizens Police Review Board. It is an, an impediment to hiring more police. That is someone, let's just call her Sammy. Uh, and uh, they're here right now, and that's someone who I have to rely on to be a deterrent to bad actors in the police force. And when I say that I, that will not go unheard, those things are going, won't go unheard, and that action will be taken, I mean direct action. I'm a protester, I'm an activist, and those things will happen regardless, because that's what I'm about. And I mean those things, and if that's a threat, that's, that I mean that threat, that's a promise. Okay? okay, and so if, if you're threatening, so, and so you this, say is, you're this threatening, is this is a threat. This is a threat of, of protest. This is a threat of protest, and I mean that. So mm -hmm. that is what I want to say. But I also want to say this um, because the, <laughs> I don't think you understand. This is not history. Doesn't happen in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. So when I see someone obstructing justice. We can't wait for a mistake to happen. The mistake has already been made. And we can't wait for another mistake to happen for that person to go. I don't want my body to be the next one. And I said nothing about Sammy or whoever it may be uh, to have been on somewhere. And we already know what they believe. There's, there's no other questions about it. So. Whatever you feel about it, that's what I mean, thug life. Hello, my name is Minister Dominique Alexander, president and founder of the Next Generation Action Network. Um, as I was walking into tonight um, regarding this meeting, um, um, I heard someone speak about reaching out to me and um, I, I know one of the things as a community activist, I've always published my cell phone number. It's 469-734-7580. No one has e never had a, a problem with getting in contact with me. And also I have three fantastic staff members that check my emails regularly and they have never had a problem with anybody um, contacting me or emailing me requesting a meeting. Um, so I'll start off by saying this. One thing you would never do is define uh, Minister Dominique Alexander's actions of activism in a racist connotation because one thing I'm not is a racist. Um, one of the things I want to clear and point out, we reached out to Councilwoman uh, uh, Paula Blackman to keep a white man in place instead of appointing the person who she appointed. We asked Paula Blackman to keep a man that has been a lawyer for over 45 years in place. 
we asked her to keep a man that has literally been a former city attorney and also has represented the Dallas Police Department and other local jurisdictions in officer-involved shootings cases and different things of that nature, and that person is Dave Labrick. So if anybody is going to talk about our activism in this coalition's actions in a racial connotation, that is a huge, huge, hugely misinterpretation because one thing we have not, I think one of the things is, is that this board needs to understand the coalition that has created what you stand on and what you represent right now was one of the most diverse coalitions this city has ever saw regarding police accountability in this city. And I stand behind that statement. And I ask that everybody that was a part of the coalition, if you are here, please stand so that they can get a real quick understanding of the people who represent. And please don't never say that we did anything in a racial connotation. One of the things I want to also say, I thank you for speeding the process regarding Dave, uh, uh, Diamond Ross. And also I want to say about the rule regarding signing up to speak. Uh, not only the park board nor the planning commission, one of the most important boards in this city, do, do they have a rule where you sign up to speak. You come to the meeting, you sign up. That is a very suppressive rule and just because the city council has it does not mean that it is right. I ask that this board vote against that rule because remember this is the office of community policing police oversight. So it's important for people to understand and engage. And guess what? Many people don't know that they want to speak until they get here. So this is for to represent the community. So if the community walks through that door, remember, this is not a usual entity. If the member walked through that door, the member should be able to speak. Thank you. Just, just to clarify, those that want to speak, public mic, they won't have to sign up. It's just for the first 15 minutes, the first five people will, will sign up when they get here before the meeting. Only the only um, sign ups in advance are if you want to speak specifically on an agenda topic. If you just want to speak, you don't have to sign up. My name is Joel Wassinger, District 2, and first of all, I want to thank this board, uh, the majority of the board, and its chair for their excellent work. Um, I thought that the second meeting, in sharp contrast to the first meeting, uh, went extremely well. Um, thank you for your leadership, and um, I appreciate, as others have mentioned, that there's been action taken uh, to address the Diamond Ross situation. Um, and. There was a lot of misinformation, as, as others have alluded to, uh, in the comments before this meeting. And, and I just want to say, uh, and I'm usually not this forthright to speak on behalf of others, but all we wanted at that first meeting was the opportunity to speak. And, um, and, and you know that. And, and, and this isn't a criticism of you. But for those who think that activists came here to cause trouble, there may be times when we come someplace to cause trouble. That wasn't our point that evening. And um, so uh, what, what interests me about that situation is at the first meeting, it was, as usual, the police who instigated violence. We came to speak. We were denied the opportunity to speak. Uh, the chief cut you off, uh, Mr. Chair and then without even addressing us, pushed us out of the room, attempted to push us out of the room. That was the uh, kerfuffle that happened that night. And we see as usually happens that, especially when people of color are involved, that the victims of police brutality are demonized and criminalized. We have one member of this board, and again, I won't name names, um, but who went on the Ricky Roberts radio show and talked about uh, the dangerous folks that were at that meeting. Not even pointing out that it was the police who had weapons, the police who initiated the use of force. So, and, and then we have others, we had folks come up in the last meeting talking about beleaguered white folks. And as Dominique has pointed out, nobody has said that this board needs to be all black or brown. I don't see that there would be a problem if it were, but, um, we, we just want this board to be able to perform its function. Hold up, hold up. Is there a problem up there?
Okay. As I as I mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, as I as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be respectful. As 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 I mentioned earlier, we're going to be respectful. All right, let's hey, let's 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 be respect for everyone. Let's be respectful. No taunting, no responding. Let's let's be respectful. If you can't be respectful, ignore. Okay. So, Sir, I apologize. Uh, excuse, excuse me, excuse me, ma'am. Excuse me, ma'am. We have one person at the mic. That is the only person that should be speaking. Thank you. I, <laughs> I, I, I I did actually want to point out that the loudest voice at that first meeting and the one person who shouted an epithet at that meeting was a white man who happens to be the husband of one of the board members, one of the board members who doesn't believe this board should exist. And just as now, he helped to instigate that situation. And so I, it, it is important that that be on the record. And it is important that we don't have a meeting like this and only black folks are told they need to calm down and be respectful. And it, yeah. And again, Mr. Chairman, that, that's meant as no disrespect to you. I know you have a difficult job, but, but I do think, I, I think that words like the racist epithets that were used by a couple of the first speakers, or the, the one speaker that I recall, those should not be allowed in this space. Um, and, and I know that I, I was astonished when that happened, so I can only imagine how that struck you. Um, but again, thank you, and uh, we appreciate this opportunity and, and look forward to those who are committed to this work, um, continuing the work, and those two board members, they know who they are, we know who they are, who aren't committed to it, uh, would go on to other things. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Stacia Hope. I'm representing the District 9 and many others. Mm -hmm. I want to start off with, we always point out the police officers are your protesters, but you know what? If you remember, when you're making a call for an issue of someone been shot or someone that got beat up, it's that 911 operator. Your 911 operators are deciding what call is important. Me and my child, my sister and her two kids were in a car accident and it hit and run. That operator on there sat and said, well, sorry, but somebody else was injured worse. Well, I'm standing here with metal all up and down my spine because the police and the operators don't come out. On both sides of the parties, we do have people that hurt, people that have lost a loved one. As much as Yes, the officer that shot a person in their own home, but also an in, a, a, a citizen shooting our police. We need to come together, unite, not separate. That is what Jesus wanted us to do. If we don't come together as one, Satan will have us all. You can call anybody racist, but we all bleed the same color. And it's called red. It's called the blood because that's what Jesus put us in. It's what God made us each and formed us all unique. If we were all the same, this country would be a boring place. It's what makes us all special with a freedom of speech to speak our voice. You can be a Democrat, you can be a Republican, you can be what? But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what party we're at. It's are you a child of God? Are you forgiven? Because good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people do. So let's find love, compassion. Quit this keyboard warriors of hate. Let's bring a circle of prayer. And let's save our country from the true terrorists that are coming to our country. Because that's what's coming in this city right now. 
It's not what the police did. It's not what that thug did. Because they're not a thug, they're a human being. And if we're not going to stand up for the American people before the illegal immigrant, this country will be lost. So I ask you, let's come together as one. Let's not separate each other. Who cares of the lies? Let's state the facts. Let's state the, who the real police are and who are the ones that are just there for the money. And let's state the real people that are on the board who actually care about the people because that's what God would want us to do. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Charity Rigdon, 2948 Groveview. I'm also with the AFIA Center, and the AFIA Center is a reproductive justice organization. If you're not familiar with reproductive justice, it's um, the right to parent your child, um, not, excuse me, have a child or not to have a child, to parent your child in a safe environment, or also to parent your child without state sanctioned violence, which means police brutality. Um, one night I was standing outside and I heard this lady getting beat by her boyfriend. Um, he was beating her so bad that I ran inside to grab my phone, but in the black community, we're, with the police and going on now, police is not the first thing we run to. But I also know if I went to intervene, he probably would have whooped me too. He was screaming that he was gonna kill her and everything else. Um, the police was called on my behalf. The police was called um, and as I was calling, they also said that she was calling it in. So I sat out there and I waited. No police showed up, not one. So I'm not understanding um, I guess you can say where I live will be kind of considered the hood. But the thing is, if she's calling it in and she's pleading for help, why is no one showing up? This lady was literally beat. I could hear her. I can hear the punches being hit in her face. I could hear that. And no one showed up. I just wanted to know if it was a white woman, would y'all have come? Would they have come? What's, what is going on here? Nobody, the police are not showing up. I don't understand. And like I said, we already don't want to call the police, but I also didn't want to get beat up either. So what are we going to do to people who have to call the police and don't have no one else to call? If it was a white woman, like I said, I bet they would have showed up real quick. I'm Max Smith, Council District 13. Good evening. I don't have any complaints, but I have some suggestions. Uh, one of them is, is that all you folks need to ride with the police officer. You need to do it on a regular basis so you understand what they do and why they do it and what sort of circumstances arise. Because what you hear is people come down here and say, the police did this, the police did that. You know, police officers are individuals. Most of them are very good people. There are a few bad actors, and that's your job is to weed out the bad actors and see that they pay for what they do. But, you know, you can't just tar the whole department with the same brush. When you, when you hear in the media quotes, the police did this, and that's terrible, it was a police officer who did that, not the whole crowd, and you need to keep that in mind. Uh, second, I, I think that you ought to try to gauge community opinion. I think every one of you ought to pick 30, 40 people in your council district and call them on the phone and say, have you had, have you personally engaged a police officer this year? Not, not your cousin's brother-in-law, but, but you personally. And, and how did that go? Were they courteous? Were they professional? Were they rude? Were they abusive? And see, you know, what, what the real story is in the community as a whole. And the last question is, do you think that police ought to be more aggressive? You think they're about right? Or you think they're not aggressive enough? And I think you'd be surprised by the answer to that. A few months ago, June and July, the Department of Public Safety put 15 officers in South Dallas. Uh, they pulled over a lot of people. At the same time, they arrested 500 felons. They confiscated 500 pounds of narcotics. They confiscated 100 guns. And there were no murders in July. No murders in July. People came down here and complained about that. I don't know if they came here, they came to the council and complained about it. But I don't know that the people who live in that neighborhood who have to balance 
being abused by the police and being abused by the criminals in the neighborhood feel the same way about it. There was a lot of good done there. And you, Mr. Chairman, you mentioned you can't put a price on human life, but we do. What we're saying is, is that all those traffic stops is too high a price to pay to save lives. You know, our murder rate in Dallas has gone from around 100, 110, three or four years ago to pushing 200 today. That's 80 lives. And the part of the reason for that is, is that we have a district attorney who won't prosecute crimes under $750. We have council people in, in the, in the, that are telling the police, back off. Well, when you back off, that costs those lives. That, that adds to the murders and the robberies and the rapes and everything else that goes with it. We have empowered the criminals and handcuffed the police. And we need to be very careful about doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, it's Rick Lenoy again. Uh, I live in uh, East Dallas uh, in the Lakewood area. And um, I just want to say that I in part agree with the last gentleman. Uh, I do believe that most Dallas police officers really do try hard to do things like not kill people. <laughs> but you know, they should not have to do that by going rogue against our own general orders. Because in the general orders that are currently in place, if you look at the last part where we have the response continuum, the last step says, yeah, it's okay for us to use lethal, uh, lethal response for aggravated aggression. And then when you get into the definition of that, you find out that that turns out to be pretty much what the officer on site interprets it to be, largely based on emotions, fear, perception, belief, and so forth. Well, thank goodness, so many of our officers go out there and secretly, I think, or at least very privately, have to say to themselves, I'm never going to pull my gun out and just kill someone dead. I don't want to do that. They make me wear it, but I have no intention of ever doing that. I'm going to use every means at my disposal to de-escalate. So I commend those officers, every one of them, and that's a wonderful thing. But they should not have to do that. It should not have to be them going rogue as opposed to this idea that only once in a while an officer goes rogue and doesn't follow the rules, and then someone gets killed. No, the rules say they can kill people. There's our problem. We've got, what, 1.3 million people in Dallas proper itself? 3,000 police officers, did I hear correctly earlier, roughly? Okay, you're not going to stop all the crime in Dallas with 3,000 police officers, and I beg to differ with the other gentlemen. You know, we can have 6,000 officers, we can have 10,000 officers, we can arm them with machine guns and they can walk around and do all of that, but the real problem is the disparity in our community, this division, the fear that I've heard from many of the other persons expressed tonight, largely persons of color, and you know, I get it. If our own police department in black and white says, we kill people, we're allowed to kill people for something way less than what is in the Constitution, you know, like being convicted beyond a reasonable doubt in a court of law after due process, then maybe the death penalty can be issued. Well, for reasons way less than that, they can kill people, and they have been killing people. So you know what? I, being a, a white guy, I don't, at least I can convince myself that I don't have to be scared to death day and night that my door is going to be busted open and me get shot because I didn't look at an officer in the right way. So this division is what has to go. And uh, I would like to know, just real quickly, can I file a complaint about those general orders? That's a question after my comment. Good question. Get back to me on it. Next meeting. So in other words, I, I understand we can bring individual complaints against an individual officer's action, but can we go after the very rules that our department operates by? Oh, I was going to say, go ahead. Okay, I will do that. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Okay. 
My name is Dorothy Patterson. I am not a citizen of Dallas. I'm a citizen of Mesquite, but I have two sons and they are black males. And since the time that they were born, I told them you were born with two unfair strikes. You were born black and you were born male. In 2017, my son was murdered at the corner of Centerville and 635. In 2019, I have a son, my only child left. He was arrested and broadcast all over the news and he's still sitting there. And my question is, I am a realist and I, I deal with my issues real truthfully. I'm, I'm curious as to why the detectives were so quick to arrest the son as I, I hate to say it this way, but the good son, the one with the degree from Texas A&M cum laude off of something someone said, but then the one that was murdered, nothing's being done. I don't understand that. And then the disparities that are in the bonds being set on these inmates. There are people in Dallas County right now with the exact same crimes, but the bond on my son is Ridiculous. It's over almost a million dollars. And then the same crime that someone else committed, I'm assuming black on black, is $200,000. But because I'm feeling that this is, my son is black, white, $750,000 bond. Where is the justice in that? I don't understand how Dallas does their business, and it's sad, and I hate that I even have to be standing here, and I'm doing my best not to get emotional, because this is painful for a woman who has taught her children to abide by the law. First of all, they said, my good son, he evaded arrest, but yet the witness says he's casually walking, but they initially stopped him on that. That is the token target that they use to retain our black men, first of all, before they even tried to put a charge on them. That was their first step. I went to co try to bond him out. They told me, oh, he's been charged with another charge. But this particular son, and the only reason why I'm here is because I know this son in my heart of heart, you cannot tell me anything different because this little child has sat in a corner, when I told him to sit there and has not moved, I was on my way out the store. The sales associate was watching my son because he was so obedient. So this particular child, I'm willing to fight to the end for him. Not that I wouldn't fight for my other son, but wrong is wrong and right is right. My other son was dead wrong. But this son, I have a problem with it. And I think that the police need to be mandated. Somebody needs to do something with the way they make the arrest, the way they research the arrest, the way they question the alleged suspects. They need to do something. It is sad and it's, and it's, and it's ridiculous. And I'm heartbroken. I'm hurting not only for my sons, but for mothers of black boys like myself. And it's sad. It is really sad. And Dallas needs to do better. Really, you all do. Seriously, it's sad. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for one more. Hi, my name's Blake. I'm from District 2. Um, excuse me if I don't speak very well. I'm sort of not the most outspoken person. Um, this is my first time coming to one of these, and it's already come to my attention that there's some people here who are acting in very bad faith who seem to be here just to oppose the existence of this board. And not only that, but they're instigating uh, situations among the crowd. And I think it's really embarrassing. And uh, it's even more embarrassing to hear that apparently this person is a spouse of one of the board members. Um, I hope that the board doesn't take it seriously, the outbursts that these bad actors have. And yeah, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. It is 728. Do we have a motion to adjourn? I move to adjourn. A second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Meeting adjourned at 728. Thank you, everyone.